While Tony Stark may be best known for being a genius, billionaire, playboy, philanthropist, and, well, you know, Iron Man, he's known for plenty of other things as well, like his sarcastic quips that always get a laugh from the crowd. The best of which have to be the nicknames he's given pretty much every character in the MCU. Tony Stark has given out over 50 nicknames throughout the years, and they're not always nice. Every single Avenger has a nickname. People he's only met once have a nickname, and he'd probably give you a nickname if he could, so let's get into all of them. The first Iron Man film is the one that started the entire MCU craze, and it introduced us to two best buds who'd be integral to the story moving forward, Tony Stark and James Rhodey Rhodes. Rhodey was pretty much Tony Stark's babysitter, because he was a little too into being a playboy back then. Plus, he had to keep his friend in good shape while they worked on the launch of the Jericho missile together in Afghanistan. As expected in this type of relationship, Rhodey would sometimes lose it on Tony when his antics became too much for him to handle, but like any good friend, Mr. Stark knew exactly how to smooth things over with his bestie. So of course, Tony called Rhodey a bunch of hilarious nicknames like Honey Bear, Platypus, and Sour Patch. You know, the type of nicknames that could calm anybody down. After Tony Stark decided to tell the whole world that he indeed was Iron Man, it was Nick Fury who sought him out as a perfect candidate to join the Avengers initiative. But as we all know, Tony spent most of Iron Man 2 turning down the offer because he was too busy trying to keep himself alive. Yeah, the threat of palladium poisoning and shrapnel piercing your heart is no joke. During one of Tony and Fury's many conversations, Stark outright declined to join the Avengers initiative and called it a super secret boy band because it was under the radar and consisted of many different superheroes. Not because they were gonna be the next NSYNC. Now, that boy band would also end up including a woman in Black Widow, but let's cut Tony some slack because he had no way of knowing that beforehand. Natasha Romanoff was introduced in Iron Man 2 when she was sent by Nick Fury to look after Tony Stark because they feared for his life. That shrapnel was causing Tony some serious distress. Natasha took on the disguise of Natalie Rushman and became Tony's assistant. They had a few flirty exchanges, but it was clear that Tony knew something was up from the jump. Still, it was nice of Natasha to promote Pepper Potts to CEO of Stark Industries, even though it was done because she feared the worst for Tony. That being said, it was a decision that would end up paying dividends when Stark decided to be more of a superhero than a businessman. Fury eventually admits that he planted Black Widow to be his assistant, which leads Tony to call her a triple imposter due to her deceptive skills as a super spy. Loki is one of the most beloved MCU characters, and for good reason. He's known as the god of mischief because, well, bad, bad things happen every time he's around. Iron Man's first encounter with Loki was when the villain attacked Germany and the Avengers. Loki was wearing his iconic headpiece, and Tony wasted no time at all giving him the nickname Reindeer Games. While there was a Ben Affleck movie released in 2000 called Reindeer Games, I feel like this is more of a Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer reference. Later on, they transport Loki to the Quinjet when Tony took another jab at the god's appearance. Instead of making fun of his outfit, Mr. Stark decided to have a go at his long black hair, calling him Rock of Ages, which is a reference to the Broadway musical set in the 80s featuring characters of similar hairstyles. Tony Stark and Captain America have always had an up-and-down relationship from the moment they had their first proper conversation in The Avengers. It was both hilarious and interesting to Tony that Steve Rogers was frozen in ice for decades, so much so that Tony just couldn't resist referring to the time Steve spent frozen in ice as him being a capsicle, a portmanteau of the word popsicle and Captain America's nickname Cap. Later on, Tony Stark cracked another joke at Steve's expense about how our favorite super soldier wasn't even remotely up to date on the modern world. Steve Rogers was literally a man out of time, which led to Tony calling him older fellow and old man, which are correct statements when you consider the fact that Cap was born in 1918, making him 94 years old in the Avengers. When Thor hijacked the Quinjet and the Avengers, it led to a battle between Iron Man and the God of Thunder in the forest. After seeing Thor's cape and hearing his vocabulary, Tony called him Shakespeare in the Park. Later on, Tony playfully calls Thor Point Break, a reference to Bodhi from the 1991 film where Patrick Swayze's character has a similar hairstyle. 
This nickname actually stuck with Thor until Ragnarok. Then the Avengers Endgame time jump happened, and let's just say it wasn't very kind to Thor. He was severely depressed, which led him to put on more than a few pounds. The Avengers let him be, understanding that what he was going through was hard, but at one point, Tony called him Lebowski due to his shocking similarities with the dude in the Coen Brothers' 1998 film The Big Lebowski. Never change, Tony. Never change. Unfortunately, Clint Barton spent most of the Avengers under Loki's control. It took him a while, but he eventually snapped out of it and joined Earth's Mightiest Heroes in the battle against the God of Mischief and his Chitauri army. During the Battle of New York, Captain America was the one who took charge and gave out orders for each member of the Avengers to follow. It was Hawkeye's job to get up to a high point, but seeing as he's just a normal human with some very impressive archery skills, he needed help getting to higher ground quickly. So he asked Iron Man for a lift. Just before Tony obliged, he called Clint Legolas, a Lord of the Rings reference that works because both characters are renowned archers, skilled with a bow and arrow. But Clint probably wishes he had Legolas's hair. We all do. Tony Stark and Happy Hogan also had a very interesting relationship. John Favreau not only directed the first two Iron Man movies, but he also plays Happy in the MCU, who's Tony's bodyguard, best friend, and Stark Industries' head of security after he was promoted in Iron Man 3. When Aldrich Killian tries to lure Pepper Potts into his master plan, Happy noticed something was off about the guy from the get-go, as did all of us. Being the good friend that he is, Happy decided to call Tony and let him know what's going on. But this wasn't just any phone call, it was a video call. Now Happy isn't the most tech-savvy guy, so he had a bit of trouble getting his full face into frame, which prompted Tony to call him the forehead of security, since that's all he could see. As brilliant a man as he was, Tony Stark has made plenty of mistakes throughout his time in the MCU, but his biggest and probably baddest would have to be Ultron. Naturally, in Avengers Age of Ultron, the sentient AI would end up turning on its creator and wanted Iron Man's head on a spike. When the AI, Pietro and Wanda Maximoff were busy getting some vibranium, they were surprised by the Avengers. Ultron just couldn't believe our heroes were sabotaging his plans, but things got worse once Tony called him Junior. Why did this tick off the angry robot? Well, that's because it's a reference to the AI's personality, which was like Tony's, but just more evil and corrupt. Also, if you think about it, since Iron Man technically created Ultron, calling him Junior could be pointing out that he was kinda like his kid. One of the most powerful characters in the MCU is Wanda Maximoff, even though she still hasn't shown her true potential yet on the big screen. Using the ability to manipulate the minds of her enemies, Wanda gave all the Avengers some disturbing visions in Avengers Age of Ultron that each hero took differently. Bruce Banner was the one who took it the worst when he unleashed the wrath of the Hulk on the city of Johannesburg, South Africa. If it wasn't for Tony's contingency plan in the form of the Hulkbuster armor to fight back against the Hulk, he would have torn that whole city apart. During the duel between Tony and the Hulk, Mr. Stark referred to Wanda as a little witch who was just messing with him. Considering she's known as Scarlet Witch in the comics, this nickname was spot on. Tony Stark and Peter Parker probably had the most unique relationship in the MCU. They first met in Captain America Civil War, where Tony recruited the young man for Team Iron Man. From there, the relationship blossomed to the point where Tony was a father figure and mentor to Peter. But before Spider-Man could join Team Iron Man, Tony sat down to try and get to know the youngster and what he's all about. Peter let him know about his spider-like powers and even showed him his homemade suit. This made it clear to Tony that his superhero name would be something to do with spiders. So he he comes up with Spiderling, Crime Fighting Spider, and Spider Boy, which are all great names in their own right. When Spider Man does make his long awaited MCU debut during that airport battle, Tony calls him Underoos, referring to his pajama like outfit. Captain America Civil War also introduced Tony Stark to Bucky Barnes, the guy who was brainwashed by Hydra and succeeded in taking out his parents. When Tony learned that Bucky was framed, he followed Steve and Bucky to Hydra's facility all the way to Siberia, which is a great place to put a hideout, if I'm being honest. Unsure of Tony's intentions, Bucky and Steve were ready to fight him until the two Avengers came to an agreement. The thing is, while Steve was comfortable letting his guard down, Bucky wasn't, and kept his gun aimed at Tony. This was the breaking point for Iron Man, who just had to let out a quip. 
He asked Bucky to stand down, calling him Manchurian Candidate, a reference to Richard Condon's novel about the American government brainwashing citizens to be assassins. Which is almost exactly what happened to Bucky. Ebony Ma is one of the most interesting-looking characters in the MCU, and by interesting, I mean gross. An honored member of the Black Order, he lives to serve Thanos. Which means he gets himself all up in the Avengers business in Avengers Infinity War. When he arrives in New York with his buddy Cull Obsidian on the lookout for the Time Stone in Doctor Strange's Eye of Agamotto, they meet up with Iron Man, Strange, Wong, and Bruce Banner, which inevitably turns into a face-off between the villains and our heroes. But before the fight even began, Tony decided to make fun of Ma's, shall I say, unique facial features, giving him the nickname Squidward. Sure, he might not sound like Squidward, but he definitely looks like the beloved SpongeBob SquarePants character. Ebony Ma is no looker, that is for sure. During Avengers Infinity War's encounter in New York between the Black Order members and our heroes, Tony Stark asked Bruce Banner to turn into the Hulk, but the Jolly Green Giant just wasn't interested in joining the party. No matter how many times Bruce tried to let the Rage Monster loose, it wasn't happening. Eh, we've all been there. Anyway, this disappointed Tony, who told his fellow Avenger that he was embarrassing him in front of the Wizards, referring to Strange and Wong. And then in Avengers Endgame, when Tony and Nebula made it home thanks to Captain Marvel, Tony was still coming to grips with everything. While talking to Cap about what had happened on Titan, Tony referred to Doctor Strange, the man who saved his life, as the Bleecker Street Magician. The nickname, of course, is a reference to the street the Sanctum Sanctorum can be found on, which is also Strange's residence. Drax is a fan favorite in the MCU because he's not the sharpest tool in the shed, which always leads to plenty of laughs. Nothing beats that moment in Guardians of the Galaxy where Drax thought that by staying perfectly still, he could become invisible. Yeah, we can all still see you, bud. Anyway, after the knowledge of Thanos' impending arrival motivated Tony Stark to take flight to Titan instead of waiting things out on Earth in Avengers Infinity War, we saw Iron Man meet some members of the Guardians of the Galaxy, including our gray boy Drax. Now, Drax isn't the type of dude I'd like to insult, seeing as he could probably send me to the moon with a single punch. But nothing can scare Tony Stark away from making a quip. He called Drax Mr. Clean due to the character's resemblance to the Procter & Gamble brand mascot. When Iron Man made it to Titan in Avengers Infinity War with Spider-Man, Doctor Strange, and the Guardians of the Galaxy, they realized that they were all out to get the same man, Thanos. But this ended up as a classic case of having too many cooks in the kitchen, because for the life of them, they just couldn't figure out the right plan of attack. In particular, it was Star-Lord and Tony Stark who butted heads and couldn't come to an agreement. We all know how stubborn those two can be. The rest of the team just stood by as they watched them bicker, but eventually Tony had enough and just couldn't get through to Peter Quill. So he told his own Peter, Peter Parker, not to listen to Flash Gordon, referring to Quill's space adventures that are quite similar to the titular characters from the 1980 movie. Nebula's character development in the MCU has been incredible. She started off as pure a villain as they come, but throughout the films, we've seen her transform into a good person. A hero, you could say. At the beginning of Avengers Endgame, Tony Stark recorded what he thought would be his final message to his beloved Pepper Potts when he was stuck in space, floating aimlessly in the Benatar. In this message, he explained why he went to Titan, and even came clean about his current situation, mentioning that he only survived the injury he got fighting Thanos thanks to the Blue Meanie. Nah, that's not a nice way to refer to someone who saved your life. But Nebula is definitely blue, and can also be very, very mean. So he's got a point. Funnily enough, the Blue Meanies were the villains of the 1968 Beatles movie Yellow Submarine. At some point in Endgame, Tony asked about Thor. The God of Thunder was very quiet in the scene, but you know who wasn't? Rocket, everyone's favorite trash panda. Surprised by Rocket's ability to speak English as a raccoon, Iron Man couldn't help but say that until this second he thought the Guardians of the Galaxy member was a Build-A-Bear, in reference to Rocket looking like a stuffed animal. He does have a point, though, because Rocket is as cute as any Build-A-Bear you can find. 
After the five-year time jump, the team got together again for the time heist, where Rocket's mechanical skills were greatly needed. Tony, being the tech genius he is, wanted to check up on the raccoon to see how he was doing, and called him Ratchet, a reference to the video game Ratchet & Clank, which features a humanoid creature with a spaceship just like Rocket. Tony Stark has always had an affinity for Bruce Banner, as someone who speaks the same language as him. Science. This is a language that I have yet to master and most likely never will, but it finds a way to bring these two Avengers together, which is just beautiful. With the team finally ready to take on the time heist following Captain America's touching speech in Avengers Endgame, Smart Hulk, or Professor Hulk, or Super Jacked and Smart Green Dude, whatever you want to call him, he was tasked to power up the large version of the quantum tunnel that would transport them to the correct time periods. Tony was the one who gave Banner the go-ahead to start the machine up calling him Jelly Green. Yeah, considering the fact that Hulk is known for being unjolly and green, Tony's being a little bit cheeky here. It's just good banter between two friends. Tony Stark and Scott Lang haven't always been on the same side of a fight, going back to Captain America Civil War when they were on different teams. While they may not have known each other that long in the MCU, they did spend a good amount of time together in Avengers Endgame, where they finally got to play for the same side. They teamed up during the time heist to get their hands on the Tesseract holding the Space Stone. They surprisingly worked quite well together and came up with a plan to accomplish their goal quietly. Of course, if you work with Tony, you're gonna get a nickname, and Ant-Man had the privilege of getting not one, but two of them, Thumbelina and Stuart Little, which are both in reference to his ability to shrink. Still, none of them are really that flattering. What was your favorite nickname? What do you think Tony Stark would nickname you? Let us know in the comments section down below, and don't forget to subscribe to CBR for more MCU content. As always, thanks a lot for watching.